Hello, it's Karen at the Cool Tool Studio. Today I'm going to be working with Aria Sprite Bronze and Cypress Copper Clay together in this mixed metal pendant. Here's what you need for this project. A work surface, clay thickness rolling frames, and the Fat Shields template. I also have some distilled water in a spray bottle, cool slip, a snake maker, bamboo embossed texture tile, and some tough guards. A tissue blade, an ultra clay pick, a scalpel, and a medium sanding stick. Some sanding pads, and then I'm going to be working with both Cypress Copper Clay and Aria Sprite Bronze Clay. Some needle files, a clay shaper, tweezers, the aqua and yellow precision hole punches, a clay scraper, a wick away and a brush, a wonder roller, and I'm going to be working with a 6x8 radiant cut stone. I'm using the green tourmaline nanogem. These two clays have different shrink rates, so it's important that you pay attention to which clay body you're putting on top of the other. I'm going to be laying cypress copper clay on top of the Aureus bright bronze clay. I'm doing so because the cypress copper clay shrinks 20%, while the Aureus bronze clay shrinks 10 to 11%. I did a couple of tests before I designed this project, and when I laid the bronze on top of the copper, the copper shrunk underneath the bronze so much that the bronze ended up sticking out over the edges and kind of pulling away in some points. So this technique is going to work much better for you if you lay the copper over top of the bronze. So as you can see, the copper is in the low areas of the texture here, making it raised on the finished piece. So we're going to start off by pressing cypress copper clay into the low areas of the texture tile. So I'm just grabbing a pinch of cypress copper clay and kind of working it a little bit since straight out of the package it's a little bit stiff to make it nice and soft and then if you've ever seen me work with finishing touches or our delicate elements um, it's kind of the same process where you've got this clay scraper and you're pushing down and dragging across simultaneously I did not prep my texture with any cool slip or a non-stick agent because if I do it just kind of peels out instead of going down into those low areas so there's some cypress copper clay in my texture. I'm gonna allow this to dry. I like speeding it up in a clay dehydrator or a hot plate. I find that this process is a little bit more successful with a dehydrator because the clay always seems to be a little bit more flexible when it's dried that way, as opposed to a hot plate or allowing it to sit. So if you have a clay dehydrator, I highly recommend you use it. If not, you can get by with a hot plate or air drying. So I had this in my clay dehydrator for about five minutes or so. And I can tell it's ready because when I bend it, you can see the texture kind of pulling away. So we're going to roll out our bronze clay to apply to that copper. I'm prepping my surface with some cool slip. I'm going to be rolling to four cards clay thickness. And then I'm going to be making this size of the fat shield today. So I'm going to trim my clay a little bit before I apply the copper to it. That way you're not going to be contaminating your clay with the copper. So I trim that top. Looks like I can take a little bit off the sides as well. So just removing some excess material. All right, peel that away, bringing my texture tile with the copper back. And I'm gonna be rolling this clay on top of this texture tile with the clay in it to apply the clay to the bronze. So this might sound goofy, but I'm gonna be spraying cool slip onto the surface. I found that if I use water, um, like my first instinct was, well, I want this clay to stick to this, so I'm going to join it with water. But when I did that, the bronze stuck to this really terribly and I had to scrape it all out and it was a mess. So I found that if I spray cool slip over the texture tile on top of the copper and then roll it, it adheres itself and then I'm going to come back and spray it with water. So let's run through that. I'm applying some cool slip and taking my bronze. And I'm going to be rolling to four clay thickness again. That's what I previously did, but it's just to kind of apply pressure to adhere it. 
I'm going to bring in a tough card. I'm going to flip and then I'm going to really drastically peel back and I'll try to do it at an angle here so you guys can see you're really pulling back on it because if you kind of pull up the copper won't come out so you're pulling back all right so I'm going to take my template and kind of line it up to the area that looks like it did the best and because I'm going to be cutting through some dry clay, instead of using a clay pick like usual, I'm going to bring in a scalpel and kind of use more of a downward pressing as I go instead of just dragging. Because I'm going to be cutting through some dry clay. And if this doesn't look great, remember that you can always come back and sand to shape. And also, if things kind of nudge off, you can bump them back into place. So again, I'm kind of going along and pressing down to cut through. All right. So I'm going to ruin my excess here. And then again, since it wasn't that super smooth drag that you usually get with a clay pick, you might have some slightly jagged edges, but we're going to clean that up once it's dried. Before that though, I'm going to come in with some tweezers and take a look and notice like this guy, I bumped upwards when I was cutting. So I'm just going to gently coax him back down. This little guy as well. So quickly look over your piece and see if anybody needs to be put back into place along those edges. Once you're happy with it, I've got a little spray container filled with just distilled water. And I'm going to spray it all over my piece and really hydrate it. It's going to absorb into the dried copper and then allow it to really adhere to the bronze underneath. So I'm going to take this off to dry. While that's drying, I'm going to go ahead and make the setting for my stone. I'm going to be working with a 6 by 8 millimeter nano gem, and I think it's a really great color with the bronze. It's a green tourmaline nano gem. So we're going to be testing the thickness of the stone, and to do so, you stack up thickness frames until you can take a snake maker and run it across the stone and not move it. So this is a little short. So I'm going to swap out that three for a four clay thickness rolling frame. And as you can see, my stone's not going anywhere. So this is 15 cards thickness that I'm going to be making my setting. I'm gonna scoot that off to the side for a second, take my Aeris bronze, take my snake maker again, and press straight down. So I don't have a bezel template for this shape of stone. So I'm just going to take my stone, put it back in the lump, press down, and then remove my thickness frames. I've got a tissue blade here that I'm going to prep with some cool slip and I'm pushing against this edge to apply the cool slip. You don't want to drag your finger against that very sharp edge. And then I'm going to be cutting the outside perimeter of my setting. So I'm looking to give myself plenty of room because you can always sand smaller. And I'm cutting straight down. All right, so I have the general shape there established. And I'm going to flip this upside down, take the clay pick, and just kind of poke to pop that stone out. Now, I know that I want to leave some edge there to support my setting so my stone doesn't just fall right through. So I'm taking my clay pick 
and I'm kind of cutting out a middle area here. And this doesn't have to be perfect because I'm going to come in with some needle files once it's dry to um, really clean it up and also make it larger. But we're just going to give ourselves a little hole so that we can access this area with files. So I'm going to put my stone back into dry. I just feel like that helps it kind of keep its shape while it's drying. And we're going to allow this to dry as well. So this piece has dried and I'm going to be refining the edge. I have a super fine sanding pad and I'm going to use that to reestablish this outside shape. So I'm just kind of smoothing out the unevenness that was created by using the scalpel. And this is also a good test to, you know, see if these copper elements really are adhered as I'm going along and knocking into them. They would pop off if they weren't properly adhered to your bronze background. So again, when you're sanding along edges, follow the edge instead of going up and down. That'll just keep you from putting additional stress on your piece and potentially breaking it. And I'm just using the super fine at this point. Once my piece is finished, I'll come back with the ultra fine and micro fine for my final finish. But for now, we're just shaping. So I would like to put it down and then kind of seeing it on this black tough card makes the edge a little bit more noticeable. And I can see that there's still a little bit of unevenness there to, that I can come back in and clean up. but it's easier to see when it's on something black and high contrast. It's looking a little better. So keep working on your piece until you're happy with the shape. So I'm bringing my setting back to my workboard, and I'm going to be working with some diamond needle files to refine the setting. And I'm gonna start off by, again, popping my stone out, just fill it out, and I'm going to be working on this internal shape first because it's easier to refine the inside shape when you have more to hold on to. When I refine this edge, I'm going to kind of decrease the amount that I have to hold on to. So we're going to start off with the interior shape. I've got the square shaped diamond needle file and I'm going to start off with that. I'm going straight up and down inside my setting to remove material. And actually, as I'm going, I'm kind of noticing that it's kind of peeling up. So I thought it was dry from the outside, but it's actually not. So I'm going to put it back into the dehydrator. Um, but this time, now that it's kind of has its shape established and is partially dry, I'm going to put it back to dry without the stone in place. So that should speed up the drying of the internal shape as well. So I've given this piece a little bit more time to dry. And let's go back in and see if it's dry yet. You should see more of a crumble when you're filing and see some kind of dust and powder falling through. There we go, so we're dry. And ideally I'm gonna end up using this file for the sides, but sometimes you have to start with a square file to open it up a little bit. And I found that with nano gems, um, having minimal material behind them is important in retaining their sparkle after they've been fired. So again, you wanna make sure you're leaving a ledge. I can't quite fit this file this way yet. So I'm gonna come in the square file for these sides. And again, you wanna make sure you leave yourself a ledge for your stone to sit on, but you're kind of trying to eliminate all that excess material that will be blocking out light. So I'm gonna see if I can bring this guy in here. Come back and do those sides again. And I'm just gonna keep on working with this until I'm happy with it. All right, so I've removed the material from the inside there. I'm gonna pop my stone back in and that's just gonna support it while I'm sanding the outside edge. So again, I always like to start off my settings using the medium sanding stick. 
Um, it helps me kind of stay straight up and down while I'm removing material. And this is already pretty close to the size that I want. I'm just gonna be kind of straightening out my edges and rounding out my corners a little bit. If you want, you can square the corners and kind of follow the shape of the stone, but I just rounded it out. I like a kind of softer edge there. So again, I'm not trying to remove too much material. I'm just trying to establish the shape here. And I'm always kind of checking and looking at my stone and kind of looking at this line and making sure that this outside line isn't coming in on one side. So I'm kind of looking to the lines on my stone as guidance for how to shape this outside edge. It's also always important to remember that your setting is going to shrink and make sure that you leave yourself enough material, especially with base metal clays. I have a slightly higher shrinking rate. So it looks like I need to take a little bit more off this side. And then I'm gonna come in and like I said, if you want, you can kind of follow the symmetry of the stone and square off this corner, or you can round it out. So I'm just gonna keep on working with this medium sanding stick until I'm happy with the shape. And then I'm gonna move on to my sanding pads to really smooth out the surface. So now that I've established the shape, I'm gonna be using the super fine sanding pad to start to clean up the scratches that were made by the sanding stick. And also, I like to kind of round this top edge. And that's another choice that you can make. Maybe you like that flat plane in that sharp corner, but I'm gonna kind of soften that edge there. And that's easier to do with a sanding pad, just from the flexible nature of the sanding pad as opposed to the firmness of the sanding stick. So I'm kind of taking down that sharp corner. And then again, going over those sides. And then I'm gonna work my way from this super fine sanding pad to the ultra fine sanding pad and wrap things up with the micro fine sanding pad. And then I'll just give me a really nice surface once the piece has been fired. So I've sanded my setting, um, but I'm gonna flip it over. Don't forget your back. I'm going to, again, kind of start with the super fine and then work my way to the micro fine. All right. Knock out some of that dust. So now I'm gonna bring back the main component of my pendant here. And as you can see in this finished piece, the stone doesn't just kind of sit on top. I actually kind of set it in some and broke that top edge. I just kind of like the way that that looks. But instead of just setting it on top, I wanted my piece to have a nice flat back. So I kind of eyeballed where I want it to be. Again, if you want it in further, that's an option, but I just kind of wanted it gently breaking that edge there. I'm gonna take my clay pick. I'm gonna apply some pressure, try to keep things from moving. And I'm using this just to kind of scribe a line. So I'm not actually cutting or anything. I'm just giving myself an idea of where I will be cutting. All right, I'm gonna take my stone out and you can see I've got a nice little guideline there to follow with my scalpel. And I always cut a little bit on the inside of my lines because again, we can come in 
and remove more material using our files and sanding pads if we need to. But it would be quite tricky to put some material back. So try to cut as close to your line or inside your line. And if at some point you're kind of lost a little bit, you're like, oh, is that my line or is that just a break in the clay? You can put it back, kind of check, and cut it out. All right. So checking it, got a nice fit there. And we're ready to join these pieces. So I'm just gonna take this off to the side really quick, get rid of that sanding, because I'm gonna be working with some water and I just like to have a clean area where I'm gonna be making things damp because otherwise all that little dust could stick and potentially stick to the copper on top there. So I'm gonna grab myself a wick away and a brush and we're gonna start attaching these pieces. So I'm gonna start off this connection with just water and I've got a little brush here. I'm gonna moisten and I'm going to dampen both the surface of this shield shape and of my setting. And then I'm just gonna bring it in and apply some gentle pressure. I'm gonna come back, run the brush over one more time. And then I'm gonna take this off to dry and make the little loop here that you can hang your piece from. So I'm gonna make that loop to be the same thickness of my shield component of my pendant. So it's going to be four cards thickness. I'm prepping my surfaces with cool slip. And then just rolling a sheet. Bring in another tough card. And I'm going to be working with the 10 millimeter and six millimeter precision hole punches to create this loop. Grab a little more cool slip. And I personally find that it's easier to cut the outside of the loop first and then kind of eyeball the inside. So I'm cutting that outside edge. And I always do a couple because while you're making them, you might as well make yourself an extra for another project or in case you don't quite center the first one. A lot of cool slip. And I'm trying to just eyeball for center here. All right. I'm gonna remove my excess clay. Sometimes I find that it helps to not distort these donut forms if you kind of cut some escape lines. All right, so I'm going to allow these to dry and we're gonna revisit our pendant and see about reinforcing that connection. So in the amount of time that it took this connection to dry, my jump rings actually dried as well. So I'm going to attach the little loop up top and then I'm going to come back and reinforce all my connections in one go. So kind of like before, I'm just sort of eyeballing where I would like this to be. Um, I think that joining the full loop to the top of the stone here would be a little bit risky because you don't have quite as much point of contact as you would if you scooted up and had two points of connection in more surface area. But anywhere along kind of here would be a good connection. So I'm just kind of eyeballing where I want it to be. And you can come in and scribe first, but 
since it's just such a direct, straightforward cut, I'm just gonna leave that there and cut straight down. Get that off, put it back, check to make sure it looks good. And then just like before, I'm gonna kind of preliminarily connect these elements by moistening them. And then once these have dried, we'll come back in and really reinforce them and make them nice, strong joints. So I'm scooting it around a little bit until it looks nice. And then just like before, adding a little bit more water. So now, like always, <laughs> we're gonna take this off to dry and then we'll revisit it once it's been dried. So now that these pieces have been joined with water, I'm gonna come back in with a clay shaper and some additional bronze clay to reinforce the connections from the back. So I'm gonna flip it over and you can kind of see that gap there. So we're gonna start off by moistening my piece And then I'm gonna pick up some clay on my clay shaper and kind of place and drag. And I absolutely love this cup round extra firm clay shaper. Um, I use it for, oh, I don't think I survive a single project without it nowadays. Um, it's just a really great way to smoothly apply clay and really work it into low areas. I like to start it off dry, but if things are kind of drying out, I'll dip it in water as well and use it. It's also good with that kind of sharp edge on the top. You can use it to remove material if you're finding that you applied too much initially. And it gives you a really great basis. I'll come back and sand over this connection, but if you can save yourself less sanding work, you might as well. So I'm going to repeat that process with this jump ring up here. And I'm not really applying a lot of pressure. Um, if you would like, you can kind of support your piece by placing a finger underneath it to prop it. Kind of applied some and dragged away the excess there. Apply and drag. Then I'm gonna dampen it and smooth that all out. All right. That looks pretty good. So I'm gonna flip it. Check to remove any excess that came up on this edge. And then since I've dampened that side, I figure I might as well re-dampen this surface to kind of just encourage as much connectivity as possible. And then we're gonna let it dry very thoroughly. And then we'll talk about cleaning it up and firing it. Now that all my elements are connected, I'm gonna wrap this up by going back through the sanding pads to clean up the surface. And again, this is just so that once it's fired, it's gonna shine up really nicely with minimal work. So I'm not really doing any shaping, so I'm not gonna use the super fine. I'm just going to jump in with the ultra fine. And um, you also wanna clean up your back. Like I said, that clay shaper does a pretty good job of applying clay smoothly, but I'm gonna, even that out even more with the ultra fine. If you did have a lot of excess clay on the back, you could certainly use the super fine. But I'm just gonna start off with the ultra fine because I don't have that much material to remove. All right. So I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna lay it down flat. I was supporting 
this side with my hand since it was uneven. But since this is a nice flat back, I can use my work surface to support it while I sand. And I'm gonna use my microfine on the textured portion. And this is kind of a last chance. Like I'm not really doing too much to the surface here as much as I'm testing to make sure that all these copper pieces are very well adhered. They would knock off at this point if they weren't. So we're looking pretty good. So again, just kind of going over the entire piece with this microfine sanding pad. And then once it's fired, I just toss my pieces right into the tumbler and they come out with a beautiful shine. When you are happy with your piece, I always like to finish things off by dusting away any dust that was made from sanding, especially you wanna make sure that you're not gonna be firing bronze on top of your copper there. And then with the nano gems, I like to pop them out and then I'm gonna dip it in some rubbing alcohol, kinda of shake off any excess, and then I'm gonna allow it to dry and then use my tweezers to place it in. I found that this is a really nice way to clean off any oils or anything that's going to turn the stone cloudy in the firing process. Once it's dry, I'm gonna use my tweezers and not my fingers to place it. And then I always use this flat face on my tweezers to kind of apply some pressure to make sure that it's sitting in its seat nicely. When we were testing the Aris bronze clay, I was in communication with its creator, Cindy Silas. We wanted to figure out if it could be co-fired with her cypress copper clay. We discovered a firing schedule that works to fire both the cypress copper clay and the bronze clay together. For the first phase of firing, you're going to full ramp up to 650 on a wire rack. This allows all the binders to burn off. For the second phase of firing, you're going to submerge your piece in coconut carbon. You're going to full ramp up to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit and hold for three hours. I really enjoyed this project and I love the look of the cypress copper clay on top of the Aris bronze. It's nice and subtle because I worked with a small texture, but if you like the look and you're hoping for something more bold, you can use a texture tile that has thicker lines, like I did in this cuff. I think there's a lot of fun possibilities that you can explore this technique and I hope you give it a shot. I hope you've enjoyed this project video. If you've never worked with mixed metals before, this could be a great place to start. Thanks for watching.